Welcome to NASDAQ Trade Talks. I'm Jill Melandrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ. Joining us for the segment, we have Brad McMillan, Chief Investment Officer at Commonwealth Financial Network, to discuss if we are headed for the next great financial crisis. Brad, it's great to see you as always. Welcome back to Trade Talks. Thank you so much for having me again, Joe. You got it. What's going on here with the U.S. banking system? Do you think we're headed for the next great financial crisis? The short answer is no. When we look at what's going on, yes, there are some problems. We've seen some banks fail. We've seen some big banks fail. But when you get into what happened and why, there were reasons specific to those banks, not to the system as a whole, that made those banks fail. So it's not indicative of, of a systemic problem. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean we're out of the woods because it's a sentiment thing, panic can spread. But what the Fed, what the government did to handle that, because it's not just the Fed, is they went in early, they went in hard. They actually dealt with the problems that could have made it systemic. And because of all that, I think this is gonna be an isolated issue. We're not through with the turbulence yet. There's a lot that still has to happen, but we're not headed into another financial crisis. So what should we expect next? Well, let's take a step back and see what's happened. We saw some banks fail. We saw the government step in to guarantee the deposits. But there's a big problem there because the reason the banks failed was they had a very high percentage of uninsured depositors. So if you look at insured depositors, if you look at people who have less than, say, a quarter of a million dollars in the bank, which is me and probably most of the people who are listening, you know, it's like, OK, the bank failed, but I'm going to get my money back. I don't have a need to pull that money. But if I'm a company, if I'm a company, I have to run that risk and I either have to put it in a bunch of banks or I have to put it in a safe bank. And the only really safe banks guaranteed are the really, really big ones, the too big to fails. So the banks that are getting into trouble are not the little ones with the average mom and pop depositor. It's not the really big ones. It's the ones in the middle, the regional banks. Yeah. And that's why we've seen their stocks take such a hit because they're getting hit on two levels. First of all, they're getting hit on the asset side because they have the same problems that took Silicon Valley Bank down just to a lesser extent. But they're also having problems on the deposit side as depositors ask, do I really want to be here? And that's where the real risk lies. And that's where the government tried to get ahead of that. But we're still not there yet. Mm -hmm. There were three things that caused the great financial crisis in 2008. Explain to the audience what they were and why it's different this time. Sure. The first is when you look at a bank, there's two sides to it. There's the deposits, which we can just look at. And then there's the assets. And the assets right now are, by and large, tradable public securities. They're government bonds, for example. We know, what go we know what the government bonds are worth. We know they can be sold. There's an active market. A lot of them are agency mortgage securities. Same thing. We know what the value is. We know they can be sold. In other words, there's clarity about what the banks own. And that was a big problem in the financial crisis because with all of the weird mortgage-backed securities and the no ninja loans, no income, no job, no assets backing them up. Nobody really knew what their counterparty, if they were solvent or not. Now we know what the assets are. So there's a lot more clarity. So we're not going to see the kind of breakdown in the financial system we did then because you can actually do a reasonable risk assessment of your counterparty. So that's one thing. We've got more clarity. The other thing is we've got more capital. The foundation of the banking system is much more solid. One of the things that we did here in the U.S. to a much greater extent than, re than in the rest of the world is we said to banks, you have to have more of a cushion. You have to have more capital to absorb losses. And of course, the banks kicked in screen because that cuts into the profitability. But by and large, we've held to that. And so what we've seen is even with the losses from the, um, from the assets, from the bonds as interest rates have gone up, most banks are still very well capitalized. So you've got capital here that you didn't have back then. So you've got a more solid system that's more transparent. And because of that, the last remaining piece is credit. Banks couldn't get credit when they ran into trouble. And for whatever reason, they were illiquid, not insolvent, but illiquid. They couldn't access cash. And what we have here is the government has made a very specific decision to make that credit available, to lend against those assets at par not against what the market value is, but what the face value is. Now that's not gonna solve the problem. The banks still have to fill in the hole in their asset base, but now they've got time to do it. They can actually work it out. So there's no need for them to fail. Mm 
So when you look at the three things that killed us in 2008, clarity, capital, and credit, we've actually got all of those addressed and we're in a much better place than we were. So if we look more near term, do you expect to see some more turbulence? I do expect more turbulence for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's going to take time for all of this to play out. Mm -hmm. I mentioned the regional banks, you know, depositors are figuring out where they want to be. That's going to take some time. The regional banks have to figure out a way to make themselves more appealing to those depositors. They have to figure out a way to recast their business models. More broadly, all banks have the same kind of asset backed problems because of the erosion of higher interest rates. So the industry is not as solid as it was. That perception is there. It just takes time for this stuff to sort itself out. But the good thing is we had the time, but we're going to have some turbulence for the next weeks, maybe months, mm -hmm. until we figure that out. Brad, you know, it seems as if the blowups, whether it's the banking sector or elsewhere, it always comes back to the same thing, leverage and liquidity. How come lessons are not being learned here or just does it come down to greed at the end of the day? What we've seen over and over again is banks blow up. And, you know, I'm, I'm of a certain age. I've seen this in the 80s. I've seen it in the 90s. I've seen it. I've, it happens roughly every 10 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. Because what happens is we get a blow up in 2008, for example, and we put restrictions in place. But then over time, things are good. The bankers start lobbying. And in fact, this is exactly what happened with Silicon Valley Bank. No, we're doing OK. We've learned our lesson. We've got this figured out. We don't need the restrictions and then things blow up again. You can call it greed, that's not wrong, or you can call it responsible capital management by the banks. They're playing, they're playing their hand, and it's up to the government and the regulators to resist that. And they can't always do that as well as perhaps they should. All right, Brad, appreciate the insight as always. Thanks for joining us on Trade Talks. I'm Jill Malentrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ.